sorry. Thank Bye. you very much for the amazing talks from our friends and people we work with for last about 20 years. Hello. <laughs> Clip it there. It should be good. Anywhere. Yeah. Can you hear me? If you speak. Please. Okay. <laughs> So we've just wanted to wrap up today with uh, not so much being pessimistic because it's not my bag, uh, but okay. with being enlightened realists uh, and quickly look at what it is what we actually can do within our group, but also what we can start doing within slightly wider group we have some influence over because it's enough to steer Bill in the right direction and he can start a small war. Maybe he can finish a small war as well. So just to sort of going back to where, where we kicked off, 1994, quite a lot of you were here on the journey. Uh, and it just amazes me how uh, big the original cyber cafe movement was and how <coughs> incredibly opportunistic the business was because they jumped on us straight away. We were trying to create something beautiful and just behind us there was a lot of large companies trying to sit on it and squeeze it. And over the last 20 years it was this sort of battle, in and out, in and out. But we, we pushed through and here and there we had a bit of uh, success pushing women online because that was always a big struggle and I think we are sort of slightly on the brink of actually getting better but it really took about 20 years. So, uh, Kaf Lekuter, who is here somewhere. Kaf, where are you? Whee! Kaf is on that picture. This is sort of around early 94. And pretty much all of us stayed in the business, pushed through, used technology, promoted, taught women, dragged women to computing for better, for worse. Uh, and I think we're getting to a point where next 20 years probably will be a bit easier. But we also had a few helpers. Uh, oddly enough, he was one of our, he was one of our investors. Uh, and I think the combination of the culture of internet and music was what helped us to promote the culture abroad. Because I think you have to remember, those of us who were involved in setting up the original cyber cafes, uh, we were pretty much everywhere. We were in Manila, in Tokyo, in Paris. We actually were in Saint Pompidou, the first British company that has been invited to Saint Pompidou. And I think we were the only ones since, because they had such trouble with us, they decided not to. Uh, we also worked with David Bowie, who was one of the very, very early adopters, uh, who really and truly understood the internet, uh, was one of the founders of BowieNet, way before anybody else figured out, although I never found out he was really only interested in protecting his copyrights. So lesson learned there. Uh, and we entered in slight uh, pop world as well. We worked with Barry Garlow. I think at some point uh, I taught Kaylee Minogue how to send an email, uh, which was quite a shocking experience for us both. <laughs> and uh, since then she stopped saying she's a technophobe because when we taught her, we taught her well. Uh, and we went also to explore other parts of UK, so we had an uh, incredible experience in Edinburgh. So when you were up about being on the fringes with Daniel Bryan, we were following just behind with Siberia. Uh, and that was a great experience and I, I really regretted that we haven't pushed longer to stay and connect ourselves better with parts of UK. Because when you look at the open access, it really makes a big difference if someone didn't have Siberia or someone did. It somehow left a little bit of a mark and connection to modernity. Uh, for better or for worse, the places where we didn't manage to get through um, turned out to be not that great. So our big adventure was Tokyo, but really Thailand for me, I think it taught me that internet is not necessarily one-to-one. -one. Internet is one-to-many, particularly the cultures which are very collective cultures. We had to redesign the whole thing with having little computer pods hanging from the ceiling with seats around it because the Thai kids refused to be there one to one. They wanted all the friends with them. And that kind of first time it dawned on me that this is a social adventure. That internet is not about me and a computer and somebody far away. Internet is about social, physically and uh, virtually. And we learned quite a lot from that. Uh, we also explored the rave community. It was always a slight touch of undercurrent of counterculture there. 
slightly by coincidence, because they needed us at the time, because the rave culture was being pushed out by John Major government, and we helped them quite a lot with organizing themselves. So this was sort of our first lesson in politics and how to help uh, people survive. But we also, we have to remember that when we showed up, Microsoft, AOL, CompuServe, and a little bit of BBC, they were very walled gardens, and we started breaking it up because the web, as Bill said, lent itself <laughs> to not make a walled garden. And I'm very concerned about what's going on at the moment because I think we're slightly sliding back to these walled gardens. This is one on my list to address. Uh, but the most important thing for me, which we actually addressed, was teaching people how to behave online. Uh, you might think that we still don't know how to behave online, but I tell you, we behave a lot better if it wasn't for the first 20 years of people teaching. Because one thing which Andy Cameron used to tell me, that people in the virtuality, they're still your neighbors, they're just a little bit further down, but they are still your neighbors. And that sort of stuck with me, so we put it in our no anorak required, which was the training video which really you needed a lot of anoraks to understand. Uh, but since then we started understanding the whole requirements, anonymity and, and trust. So when we had Siberia before, I spent a lot of time cleaning it up in the evening to make sure that nobody's data was left on the computer after they used it. It was absolutely sacrosanct and it was going without saying that you and your data is something that nobody would touch. And somehow over the next 20 years, we sort of migrated from them that the, the option of being anonymous is pretty much unheard of. Everything is given, everything is taken, everything is uh, assumed that it belongs to the providers. Uh, so then we learned to work with uh, data in a different way. So EasyNet, David's uh, and Keep Tier company, which I think he invented hashtag, because I think since Around 1995, they had to change the logo after not paying some other bills, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in order to escape whoever we owe money, they just sort of did a bit of new logo on the paper napkin, and that was the logo which, which stayed on with the business for almost 19 years. Uh, but part of being uh, belonging to the family of EasyNet also taught me how many opportunities to change are if you invite the right people on the board. And I think we just have to call up on them again, because what happened over the last few years, we apparently sp sp spent less time sleeping than we are using the devices. And that really stopped me in my tracks, because I kind of see that is the case with my daughter, and I probably can see with the case of quite few of us. And that really changes everything, because the implication of it is that the, what we do with it is pushing more and more data. So this is obviously my area of my passion. I fell into it after Siberia and I love this so I stayed. Uh, but if you look at it, 17% of clothes are being bought online in UK. Imagine how much data it creates, how many of your daily behaviors at shopping the, the retail companies are getting. And that's growing even more exponentially than the actual hardware usage and the, and the data. So what we're trying to work on now, not knowing what we know, that we all live and die by good old muscle of Wi-Fi triangle, we're trying to understand what we can do about any of these layers to extract ourselves slightly from that equation. Something that completely freaked me out last week, I was doing a bit of testing for a friend's app, and I realized that although it was a very good app, it was projecting the makeup on my face without me actually having put that makeup, which was quite nice, because you can try more things, but it was also taking the data of my face and it was loading up over a period of five minutes, incredible amount of information about my face without me actually opting in at any point. Uh, more so, body data, the same. This is a virtual changing room when you sort of drop a piece of clothing over your body. Uh, the same, I didn't opt in at any point, but my body data was taken and kept on the providers. And I call it digital trespass, they call it helping. <laughs> <laughs> and this is where we kind of have to map up what it is what we're meant to be doing with ourselves, because part of the uh, reinvigoration of the high street and the presence of the new internet on the street, which is the iBeacons, which we're working on a lot, and helping people have location-based information. It just means that the data is floating around, kind of really wanting to be captured by people who you haven't given permission to. And an example of it is purple internet, people who are based in York and now in Camden, 
who are capturing your data while you're using Wi-Fi without you actually having opting in or accepting the splash screen. It's got to the point where it's becoming normalized, and that normalization is something that we have to take on and we have to take it off fast, because that means appropriation of the commons and nobody's business what I do on the high street if I don't agree to it. Uh, so we did a little bit of testing, what actually is really useful, because I know about data. You know, I've done quite a few years of data, and I was a bit dubious why so much data is being gathered and what's being used. And as you've noticed, Tesco has just announced that they missed 250 million of the forecast. <laughs> That's a lot of Kellogg's conflicts. <laughs> and these are people who keep buying big data companies, one after another. They just bought socionomics a while ago, big data companies. So what happened? Is that data kind of got lost under the drawer somewhere? So you know, when people drive that whole big data stuff, it's most of it's complete nonsense. Because actually what we discovered during a little bit of testing on uh, Wikipedia Barbica, that you only really need to know a tiny proportion of information to really and truly help people. And you don't really need to know anything more than minimum. You can keep them pretty much anonymous if they give you permission to know where they are within a specific time. So the location and time, but only permitted within one or two or three or four. It's absolutely enough for me. They don't need to know anything else. The rest of it is just trying to find ways, use cases for something they will never find. <laughs> and we sort of got to the point where even my kids are only on Snapchat because they don't trust anybody. Kids are much more preoccupied. The millennials are much more preoccupied with data than we are because they get into trouble all the time. And they had to learn the hard way. What does it mean to drop a line or gossip on Facebook? It's bad. So what information, what can we teach, teach them? How can we help them in their journey? Which sort of comes back to the whole anonymity debate. Uh, kids understand anonymity very well. And I think we have to turn on and off our concept of anonymity and get back to that. Because that's a starting point. It was a starting point where we will respect. So one of the organizations that we came across, thanks to Ed and Kimi, hello, uh, is Wikipedia, uh, which has got its own netiquette. It's not exactly the one that we looked at for when we were in Siberia, but nevertheless it's netiquette. Nevertheless it's got quite a lot of its own little culture solutions for how they get things done and how the digital and physical cooperates in, in, to create something bigger not the sum of parts. So when you look at the last 20 years, I'm nowhere near as negative as Bill, because I think we've done quite a lot. Uh, we can do a lot better, but if we go to the point where we have Wikipedia, for me, it's quite a good starting point, because the mistakes have been made, and we have trusted people a lot more than we can do, but anybody who was on that conference this summer, uh, I think we'll really truly understand that there is way out of the hole, and part of it is Wikipedia. Uh, which part we're not quite sure yet. Um, obviously, the Hong Kong digital citizens, as we're <coughs> observing now with the process, they I love their charges. I mean, they're really so well prepared. Uh, but they're showing us how important are certain elements of the network and what actually it means to be a digital citizen. We took it for granted, but now we have to revise it and pin down exactly the components of what a digital citizen needs for us. So coming back to why we <laughs> do it the event, Andy Cameron, who was a great inspiration to us all, um, and uh, his wife Emily and sons are here. Uh, we would like to get back to what Andy was always focusing, focusing on, which is online, we are all digital neighbors. We lost it a little bit. We allowed the community to grow without remembering that whoever you meet online, you treat them as if they are next to you or in your house. And that we need to get it back and figure out how to ask people who can help to start living the same way. So we started writing a, a pledge to MPs because you know elections are coming. Uh, there is a whole list of things that we know need to be done better. We call it digital citizenship. A number of them were mentioned today. I think Justin has specified quite few hardware and software requirements that need to happen. We know what we need to fix. We know what needs to be supported. We know that MPs don't understand any of it. We have established that over last year, that's with the exception of maybe two. Um, there is very little engagement. There is very little understanding. But nevertheless, I think 
despite the opportunity to disengage from our point of view, go deep down, hide, and go into internal immigration. I think it's not an option. I think the only option is to go and fight and get it on board to get it better. So uh, we're working on the pledge which we put on the website. Each of you have got an MP. Some are better than others. Uh, most are pretty hopeless. But nevertheless, it's our job to work on them. And they will only do anything at all if we, if we communicate. Because we obviously worked on the surveillance over last year. We got absolutely nowhere. Uh, this country is not Germany. People don't have the innate um, irritation with bank surveillance. Most of people who know, know. But everybody else north of Watford doesn't care. We know that. And we have to live with it. But we also have to educate people. And this is a long-term game. I think that's what Eleanor Society said on the Future Everything. That uh, we're in this for 50 years. But I'm not that worried about it because I'm Polish. You know, we didn't have a country for 200 years. <laughs> we got it back. So I think 50 years is not a worry, but it means that we have to keep going. So those are things that we're working on. We would like you to comment on them online. It's on CyberSummer website. Try to get it better. Most of it is pretty damn obvious, but most of it is not going to happen unless we push for it. Uh, particular issues like cybersecurity, authentication for us all. Without us, not going to happen. So, following on Andy, from digital pioneers, so a lot of us, to digital natives, people like cyber salon students, the guys who are finishing universities now, this is from us to you. Because we were given this incredible opportunity to create stuff within fairly open internet, with fairly open access, we downloaded music for free, we had a lot of fun. And now we're leaving a bit of a mess for you, and we feel that's not right. So before we put up our boots up and go and buy houses in Spain, uh, we decided that we actually have to fix things. And this is our opportunity to get together and leverage our relationships with politicians, with big companies, small companies, technologists, and try to fix it. Because it is fixable. We build it so far, we can do it much better. But it is a global issue. And it's one of the lessons we learned from Siberia that the future is global, but it also has to be local. How to treat the neighbor who is in Indonesia as if he sits next to you in the same house? How to treat somebody who is in Tokyo as if he came to dinner for, with you in your living room? But we have to get our heads around it, because that's the challenge. So on that note, I would like you to have a look at the pledge, uh, comment on it. We're having two weeks uh, remix and a bit of crowdsourcing, and I would hope that uh, we can get it to House of Commons within next sort of month or so, uh, and work on them because they only the MPs will only do something if it's about thousand letters per day. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. But we can get it done. Thank you very much, and over to the drinks.